In this unit, we're going to talk about what it takes to become an expert teacher. The answer is not really. Teaching is a cognitive skill, and that means teachers must have sufficient room and working memory, the right factual knowledge in long-term memory, and the right procedural knowledge in long-term memory. But is that all that teachers need? A teacher's knowledge of their domain or subject matter is crucial, but so is pedagogical content knowledge. This is the knowledge of how to teach your content effectively. As you can see in the diagram, there's an overlap between knowing your content and knowing how to teach it. You may recall when we talked about expert blindness, just because someone is really, really good at math doesn't mean that they can teach others. Pedagogy is critical. Being an expert in math can help you see where your students are making mistakes or lacking foundational knowledge, but you have to know how to teach them. So where does technology fit in? Whether we like it or not, technology isn't going anywhere. So it's important to consider how we can use technology to enhance teaching and learning. There's a place for it and your expertise will help you figure out where that is. Interestingly, or unfortunately, data show that teachers improve during their first five years in the field, and after this, the curve goes flat. That means that a teacher with 20 years of experience is no better than a teacher with 10. Think about why this might happen and what we can do about it. Think about what we already know about practice. One of the best strategies when we're trying to improve is to get feedback from teachers, not from your students and not from yourself, but other teachers. Willingham suggests very specific steps on how we can improve our practice by getting and giving feedback effectively. How we review teaching and provide feedback is very important. Think about what we've discussed regarding feedback throughout the semester. Don't forget step five. Going through the steps to get better is important, but it doesn't do any good if you don't apply what you've learned to your practice. Willingham also suggests some things that we can do independently. First, keep a teaching diary. Write down when a lesson goes well and when it doesn't so you can reflect on what went wrong and how to correct it. And when things get tough, you can look back and see where you did well. Second, start a discussion group with other teachers. This is great for social support and you can discuss difficulties with lessons or students and brainstorm solutions. Finally, observe your students in the wild. Find out what interests them and what motivates them. This is great for building rapport, but also so you can use what you learn in your lesson design. We talked in the beginning of the semester about how we should use science to inform instruction. Two areas of science that we frequently use are developmental psychology and cognitive science, what we're learning in this class. Much of this work is often derived from lab studies where students are tested or observed in a controlled setting. Why might that be bad? Think about the differences between a classroom and a laboratory. The alternative is applied research. Applied research is quasi-experimental, meaning that there's not random assignment to an intervention or control group. The setting is often a classroom or other school building, and it is not completely controlled, at least not compared to a lab setting. However, applied research is still answering one or more research questions by some type of variable manipulation or instructional intervention. Another way we can use science in the classroom is through evaluation. The purpose of evaluation is to determine the effectiveness of lesson design, such as group work or independent, 
and the effectiveness of instruction types, such as blended instruction, which is part teacher and part computer, or direct instruction, which is when a teacher gives all the instruction, or looking at things like student-centered versus teacher-centered or discovery-based learning. Discovery-based learning is providing activities that lead to acquisition of knowledge. It's important to note that discovery learning is rarely successful without a great deal of scaffolding and a lot of feedback. We've talked a little bit previously about the importance of classroom environment for developing students' mindset. Developing a positive classroom culture is part of becoming an expert teacher, and these are some of the critical features. Pause the video and read these statements about passionate teachers. Think about your favorite teachers. Did they care deeply that students shared passion and interest in the subject? Take extra effort to make sure students understood? Tolerate, accept, and learn from students' mistakes? Communicate excitement of challenge and celebrate when reaching success? Did they show commitment and caring toward learning? Expert teachers monitor current status of student understanding and their progress using frequent formative assessment. Expert teachers notice when interest is waning by paying attention to what is happening in their classroom. Expert teachers test what is working and what isn't in their teaching by paying attention to students' progress using things like progress monitoring. Expert teachers seek and provide feedback to students to help move their progress along. Do these qualities of passionate teachers sound familiar? They should. There are several things that passionate, inspired teachers absolutely do not do. And you will notice that these things tie closely to what we've been learning all semester. If I hear that you are doing these things in your classrooms, I will hunt you down and we'll talk about it. Let's remember what this unit is really about. The bottom line is this, teachers who strive to be the very best inspired, passionate, and dedicated educators they can will do the best job and their students will be the most successful. What kind of teacher do you want to be?